Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me now to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Verse 24 to 29. John 20, verses 24 through 29. This takes place after the resurrection of Jesus. He had met with the disciples. And verse 24 of John chapter 20. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were, were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. May we be those, Lord, who we weren't there. We weren't present when you showed yourself to the disciples and to others. But, Lord, we believe. And uh, we thank you that we are blessed because we believe. We thank you, O Lord, that you are our Lord, and our God. Instruct us now on what it means to say that. May we believe, for Jesus' sake. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, would you turn in the back of your Trinity, Trinity Psalter hymnals, page 877, 877. We're looking at Lord's Day 13. We've been going through the uh, Heidelberg Catechism. There are 52 Lord's Days in the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, so it's set for a year's worth of teaching. We're looking today at Lord's Day 13, question, questions 33 and 34. I'll ask the questions, and let's together answer them. Why is he called God's only begotten Son when we are also God's children? Because Christ alone is the eternal, natural Son of God. We, however, are adopted children of God, adopted by grace for the sake of Christ. And why do you call him our Lord? Because not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood, he has delivered and purchased us, body and soul, from sin and from the tyranny of the devil, to be his very own. As we are uh, going through uh, the catechism and here at Lord's Day 13, uh, it actually began in Lord's Day 8, we've been looking at what, uh, uh, what do we confess when we say the Apostles' Creed. And Lord's Day 8 talked about how that is a Trinitarian, that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then Lord's Day 9 got into the the issue of, of, you know, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and 9 and 10, uh, we focused on that. And then in, uh, in Lord's Day 11, uh, we went from the first person of the Trinity to the second person of the Trinity, and why do we call him Jesus, uh, meaning Savior? And, uh, and then Lord's Day 12, why is he called Christ, the anointed one? And, uh, and then today we're at 13. So we're, we looked at, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ. We've looked at that so far, and now His only begotten Son, our Lord, is what we're looking at today. Okay, just that you're following along uh, w with us. And uh, it's true, I think, uh, thinking about this, that 
in the, in the difficulties and the hardships of our lives, um, we struggle time to time with, with questions of self-worth. Um, and there we always need to be careful that we don't overdo the issue, um, but neither ought we to lack any sense of self-worth. Some people battle with it more than others, uh, certainly, um, but I think it's true in all, all of our, you know, heart of hearts, if you would put it that way, that we all have these moments when, um, when we don't really like ourselves, <laughs> you know, when we kind of have a low view of, of ourselves and, and, and such. And uh, the Lord, you know, comes to us uh, with his revelation about himself and of his saving work in Christ and... Uh, and that addresses how we actually view ourselves and what thoughts we ought to have about ourselves. Um, and, uh, and so we want to look today at who Christ is and what that means for us. Um, and so we're, we're making a very profound uh, confession. Thomas, his words in the passage that we read, My Lord and my God. Um, what a great profession. We can, you know, sometimes talk about Thomas, the doubting Thomas, you know, and, and such, and, and certainly there was that about him, but uh, um, he wasn't Judas. He didn't betray his Lord. He doubted for a time, uh, but then he gave one of the best professions that can be made my Lord, and my God. And that's really what we're saying in, when we say uh, that we believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord. The fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God means that He is Himself true God. So whatever characteristics apply to God... They apply to Jesus because Jesus is God. Um, the Athanasian Creed says, The Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such, is, such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. And so when we look at Open the Belgian Confession as an example, in Article 1, it gives us uh, sort of definition or description of God. And it says that God is, quote, eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, immutable, infinite, almighty, perfectly wise, just, good, and the overflowing fountain of all good. And when we say that, we're saying that's not just a description of God the Father, but that's God the Son, as well as God the Holy Spirit. It is uh, just uh, is true for the Father as it is for the Son. As, so as God's only begotten Son, Jesus is true God in every sense that the Father is. Every sense. And so those lists of characteristics or attributes is true in respect to Jesus also. Now, it is also true that this only begotten Son, Jesus, uh, was born in Bethlehem, came to earth to live amongst us, and while he lived on earth, uh, there were, you know, much of these divine attributes or characteristics were hidden. Uh, he was truly human, and uh, that is what most people saw. Um, but he was true God as well, um, which again is an argument of why... Uh, we don't have uh, or promote pictures of Jesus because you're only picturing a portion. Uh, and first, the picture's wrong. <laughs> but you're, then again, you're, and, and you're not picturing the whole Jesus ever. And so, uh, uh, but, but in, in his earthly body, when he was on earth, you know, many of those divine attributes were hidden. And... Uh, uh, and people uh, didn't recognize that he is God. The uh, 
confession that we make, though, uh, has a direct bearing on Jesus' title, Lord, as well. The term Lord is used many times and ways in the Scriptures. Um, one way, not, not the most prevalent way, but one way it is used is, is, is in the same way that we might say the word sir or, or something like that. Um, so it's just a matter of a word of respect um, and uh, more often though that term Lord involves the notion of authority uh, in, in Scripture. Um, it's kind of similar to the term uh, king. Um, you know, when we think about old uh, European culture and society where they had kings and barons and lords and knights and, uh, you know, the common people, the commoners, um, they would look up. They would look up to these barons and, and lords and, and, and knights. You know, they were kind of Above them, they had they had certain level of authority, and they would the, the common people would obey them, and um, and with that understanding, we come a little bit closer to the biblical understanding uh, of Lord, um, though we don't get all the way there, uh, but it, it gets us a little bit closer, um, where we confess that Jesus has ransomed us so that we are His possession, and uh, He is our our master. He is our Lord, uh, there is that, and that's valuable to, to see that. Um, but there's more to it. And it's important that we recognize um, that there is more to it. Uh, I think I told you not too long ago, or we talked about not too long ago, in the Old Testament, uh, the term Lord that is, is often in our English Bibles, the, 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 that four-letter word, L-O-R-D, appears in two different forms. Um, and, uh, and you'll find it printed in our Bibles, you know, kind of in lowercase letters. Um, and that, when it's, when, it, when it's that way in the Old Testament, that does have the idea of a master. Um, that translates the Hebrew word Adonai, um, so a servant may address the king uh, with that term, my Adonai, or my Lord. Uh, and that same phrase also gets used, of, of course, in relation to God, uh, that God is Lord, he is uh, Adonai. Um, and there the point is that someone is addressing God as his master, um, as Lord or as owner. Uh, but the Old Testament also has a... a thousands of instances where the term Lord appears in uppercase, uh, L-O-R-D, in uppercase. And uh, that, uh, when it appears in capital letters, is, uh, trans is the, tra the translation for the Hebrew word Yahweh, or God's covenant name. And uh, we understand that this name, Lord, Yahweh, is used of God Almighty alone. Alone. The Hebrew Old Testament was translated um, into Greek uh, a couple hundred years before Christ, called the Septuagint. And the thing there is that the translators chose to use one word um, one Greek word to translate both of those Hebrew words, Adonai and Yahweh. And the Greek word is kurios, um, where maybe you've heard kurie, uh, it's a lot of songs, kurie, um, it comes from the word kurios, Lord. Uh, it means, yeah, Lord. Um, so, Lord refers both to a master, but also to Yahweh. And I think that's instructive for us when we think about Jesus as Lord. We remember again on the night that Jesus was born and the angel came to the shepherds. And uh, there's born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. We talked about that in the first. Uh, who is Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord. Um, 
What did that mean to the shepherds? I think the shepherds had a pretty good Old Testament, had, had a good understanding of, you know, Old Testament. And so when, when the angel said, who is born to you, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, what would the shepherds have thought about that? What would they have thought? What did that sentence mean to the shepherds? The baby is the kurios, is the Lord. Would they have just thought he's a king? Or did they hear in the term kurios, the name of their covenant God? And so conclude that Yahweh is born. (laughs) And I would say it's likely both. They recognize that both is true. Some uh, verses later, we read that the shepherds reported their experience to others, and they marveled. They marveled why? Astonished. They were surprised. Because the kurios, Yahweh, is born. This, by the way, is still a stumbling block for today's Jews that Yahweh could take human flesh. That that they they just can't accept that. Uh, But it's astonishing. Remember Elizabeth, uh, when Mary came to visit her in Luke chapter 1, verse 43, uh, she says, she welcomes Mary into her home and says, Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The mother of my Lord should come to me. How interesting that is. What does Elizabeth mean when she uses that term, kurios, Lord? Simply that the child in Mary's womb is her master, is is a king? Well, I think that's included in there, but given that the Greek term kurios translates the Old Testament term Yahweh, Uh, I think there's certainly more caught up in Elizabeth's comments and that she is recognizing, acknowledging that the coming baby is a form of royalty, yes, but here's an awareness, I think, that she had of Yahweh himself coming in the flesh. The only begotten Son of God, true God with the Father and the Holy Spirit becomes a man. Yahweh on earth. And I think this understanding of the term Lord um, gives profound depth uh, to what God's covenant uh, with sinners is really all about. God established a covenant uh, with mankind in the garden, of course. Uh, then later with Abraham and throughout the Old Testament we see, we see this. And God is Yahweh, that is his covenant name, is the great I Am And the point is that he does what he says he's going to do. He's faithful to his promises. And he had bound himself with a covenant of love to his people. And uh, directly after the fall, he said, The seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head. Um, And... So God is being faithful. The Lord promised that that seed would would do that and that all of his, that God's children would go free and be be saved and be reconciled to himself. But who is that seed of the woman? What would that seed of the woman look like? The answer that we have here is it's God himself. God himself. The Lord. Yahweh, in the person of his son. Yahweh, God the covenant, God, sent his son, his only begotten son, to earth in order to ransom from Satan's power those whom God chose for eternal life. The son of God, when he came to earth, remains true God. He is true God. And therefore the title Yahweh belongs to him. 
He is Lord. He lived on earth for 33 years. And as I said before, the, you know, the human eye saw him and his humanity. Um, even though he could raise the dead and he could calm the storms of the sea, uh, clearly he is God and he even said that. Let, if you don't believe me, then let my works give evidence of who I truly am. And so uh, he is Yahweh. He is Lord. And this God of the covenant who came in the flesh went to the cross of Calvary where he would fight against sin and the devil and triumph because he is Yahweh. Here's the radical faithfulness of God to the promise that he made at the very beginning. He is Yahweh, thoroughly faithful. This is what the, the point is when we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, this is what we're saying. Uh, he is Yahweh. And so Thomas, in our passage, says, my Lord and my God. I think uh, there we can see him using kurios in its full meaning. My Lord and my God. He was deliberately, I think, attaching to Jesus that Old Testament personal name of Yahweh. That Jesus should suffer and die on the cross to pay for sin and so deliver Thomas from Satan and his power. Here is point, he, he, pointing up the glorious heights of what it means that, this, that the Lord God is Yahweh, his Lord. And uh, a few weeks after, of course, Thomas's confession here that we read in John 20, Jesus is ascended to the right hand of the Father. And Peter would later say at Pentecost, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Both Lord and Christ. Kurios. Kurios he is, master, owner, because he is Yahweh. Because he is Yahweh. He is Adonai, because he is Yahweh. He is Lord. And that identity, of course, determines how he carries out his function as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He rules today. He reigns today. He is as the God of the covenant, and uh, he reigns over all. Well, what does this mean for us? For us, this means a couple of things I just want to point out. One is there is safety and there is service for us. He has, uh, as the catechism says, um, delivered us, purchased us body and soul from sin and from the tyranny of the devil to be his very own, to be his very own, to be his own possession. Um, th this is why I began saying, you know, we can have sort of sometimes a very low view of ourselves. Um, but here, just think about it. Christ has purchased us to be his very own. We belong to to the Lord. Are there any risks to that? I mean, what I mean by, by, by asking that question is, uh, do you think that there's any chance of being kidnapped from the Lord, of being, of being snatched away from that power and safety of belonging to Him? The answer, of course, is no. Just by asking the question, we know that answer is a distinct no. The Lord God has made His covenant of grace with you and me and so claimed us as his own so deep is his love for us and his commitment to his covenant that God sent his only begotten son to be the propitiation for our sins to pay for our sins 
And this Son of God, true God, Yahweh, laid down his life to deliver you and me from the bondage of the devil. So is he going to permit something to come in and snatch us away, snatch us out of, our, out of his hand? No. We are safe. We are safe. Will he permit us somehow to, to go beyond the, uh, the range of his interest so that we're vulnerable to the enemy? And the answer, of course, is no. We are his own possession. We are his own possession. In fact, our Lord, this Kurios, this Yahweh, God Almighty, has received such power that he himself guarantees that not a hair can fall from your head apart from his will. Not a hair can fall from your head. That's our Lord. That's how much he cares for his possession. You and me. Precisely because Jesus is kurios, Yahweh, he binds himself to us and us to himself with all the love and mercy that characterizes God's covenant. So this is uh, what produces this great uh, profession of Thomas and and of you and, and, and me. In and Lord's Day 13, it says that Christ has ransomed us, body and soul, from all of our sins with his precious blood, freed us from the power of the devil to make us his own possession. N- notice how, what a parallel this is to Lord's Day 1. What is your only comfort? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. So there, there's a clear parallel here from Lord's Day 1 and, between Lord's Day 1 and Lord's Day 13. Uh, but what is Lord's Day 1 asking? What is your only comfort? That I belong to Jesus. And now we, we call him Lord because he has made us his possession. We belong to Jesus. We are not our own. We are his. And there's great safety in there. I'm so completely safe with him because... I'm so precious to him. You are safe in him and with him because you are precious to him. He laid down his life in order to ransom you from Satan's power. And he accomplished that. This is the faith that the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts. And we join with the church in all ages, Sunday after Sunday, that the only begotten Son of God is our Lord. He's our Lord. And He is worthy of our worship. He is our Lord. And we are precious to Him. But this safety that we have, one of the consequences of that is our service. Um, He is our Lord. And we are resolved then to serve Him as our Lord. We we obey Him. Um, It's true, I think, that the concept of obedience and the concept of service um, can sit sort of wrong in our sinful flesh. Um, We want to do things my way, you know. Uh, That's sort of the, the natural man. We don't want obedience. Uh, We'd rather others obey us, but we don't want to be in obedience and service um, to others. Um, But that's why it's important that we stress who this Lord is. In history, so many of the lords, so-called, they were just sinful men. Um, And when you look at history, you and read history, and you see the things that they did, sometimes very terrible against their fellow men, very brutal and wicked and painful. And to be under that authority would be awful. But that's not the case when our Lord instructs us. Uh, When Christ instructs us, 
the Lord Yahweh, the God of the covenant, the one who loves us with a perfect love, is our kurios, our Lord. And when he gives us instruction, will that instruction ever be bad for us? Will that instruction ever be harmful for us? And the answer is no. He's purchased us with his precious blood, and, and, and we are his possession. He's not going to instruct us to do something harmful to us that's not good for us. He will, would never do that. His identity as Lord guarantees us the positive value of his instruction. And that's why we can follow David's words in the Psalms that we delight in the law of God. We delight in God's law. We want to do them. As Paul himself says, to live in obedience to him. Um, you know, Abraham Kuyper uh, said correctly that there is not a square inch of life of which Christ did not say, mine. There's not a square inch in all of the universe where Christ did not say, mine. So what happens in the church here falls under Christ's command, falls, falls under Christ's lordship. It is his. He is kurios of the church. And therefore, all that is done here in the church must conform to what he has revealed to us. So this is why, you know, I will often pray, Lord, let not our agenda be what we follow. We want to follow your agenda because you're Lord. You're the Lord, not, not us. You're Lord in the church. But that's equally true in the shed and in the kitchen and in, in your workplace, wherever, you know, the hospital or wherever you are, that is true. In your office. He is Lord there too. And this is why, this is what I'm saying. And so we should always have that. Lord, it's not my agenda here. It's your agenda because you're Lord. You're Lord of every square inch. Wherever I am, you are Lord. You're Lord of all. And therefore, all that's done all the time, <laughs> anywhere, must conform to his revealed will. And the unbeliever, the one who does not recognize Christ as Lord, whose head is in the sand, you know, will not acknowledge that reality, will still pay that penalty for not acknowledging Jesus as Lord. Uh, and not living accordingly. The unbeliever will pay that penalty. But think about it. You know, woe to him who on Sunday confesses Christ as Lord and on Monday goes off and does his own thing and, and does not recognize that Christ is Lord. That's a different place. Um, that's it. Hypocrisy which the Lord sees because he's Lord. <laughs> because he is Lord of all. He sees. So what value is your confession that Christ is Lord? Well, we understand the, uh, what we've said, the content of this Lord's Day 13, it's, it's heavy, it's profound, it's, it's huge. Um, and the consequences are heavy. So tomorrow we, you know, return to our work. We, we have this blessed day of rest and worship today, but tomorrow we go back to our work, most of us. But because we are His precious possession, we're bonded to Him in the covenant of grace, we have boldness to obey convinced that he looks after us perfectly and everlastingly. He is the only begotten Son, our Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for revealing to us uh, this great, wonderful truth of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
pray that we would not profess that lordship hypocritically, but that we would recognize that he is Lord of all, and he is Lord of every day and of every aspect of my life. May we see that and revel in that and rejoice in that and be filled with wonder that, that we're not our own, but we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.